Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with chicken mushroom strudel. That's right, we need to feed six hungry people with just one half of a scrawny rotisserie chicken. And if that wasn't enough of a challenge, it also needs to be delicious and beautiful. And while all that might sound impossible, it's not. Thanks to this surprisingly easy technique. And by the way, even if you're terrible at shaping and weaving pastry, this is still going to look amazing as I'm about to prove. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by picking the meat off one rotisserie chicken, which are generally kind of dry, and in this case deformed. All right, what's up with that wing? But anyway, what we'll do is pick all the meat off the bones. And the meat from one full chicken is gonna make enough for two of these strudels. So yes, we're gonna make twice as much filling as we need. And we can freeze and save the rest for later. Or we could just make two. And of course you're gonna save the bones and scraps for a stock that we can reduce and serve with our strudel later, if we want. But anyway, you get the idea. And I'll go ahead and pick off the rest of this meat while our mushrooms are browning, which is our next step. So let's go ahead and add some thickly sliced mushrooms to a couple tablespoons of butter and a large skillet set over medium high heat. And as usual, we'll add a nice big pinch of salt, which will draw moisture out of the mushrooms. And eventually that will evaporate and our mushrooms should brown beautifully. Okay, so we're gonna take our time and we're gonna cook these mushrooms stirring for as long as it takes for them to look like this. And then once your mushrooms have browned long enough, as judged by you, we'll go ahead and toss in some diced onion along with another pinch of salt for the same reason we added it to the mushrooms. And we will cook those stirring for a few minutes until they soften up and start to turn a little bit golden, at which point we'll stop and add our seasonings, which will include even more salt some freshly ground black pepper, a little bit of ground cumin, a little touch of smoked paprika, and then last but never least, a few shakes of cayenne. And what we'll do is give it a stir and cook that for about 30 seconds, just to sort of wake up those spices. And once that's been accomplished, we can go ahead and pour in our heavy cream, and we will carefully stir that in, so as not to splash it all over our stove. And then what we'll do next, still on medium high heat, is let this cream boil and reduce until it thickens up. And I'm not exactly sure how long that's gonna take, but that's okay because we're not gonna go by time, we're gonna go by appearance. And when it looks like this, it's almost ready, but not quite. Because what we really want it to look like is this. And you can see as I give this a stir, it's thickened up quite a bit. And that is exactly what we need it to look like. And at this point we can reduce our heat to medium low, and we can toss in a whole bunch of chopped fresh tarragon, which is not only one of the great chicken herbs of all time, but maybe the best mushroom herb of all time. And then besides that, we can also dump in the pick meat from our rotisserie chicken, and we'll stir everything together. And I know I keep saying rotisserie chicken, but of course, if you want to roast one from scratch, go for it. It will be even nicer. But the whole idea of this is something that's really fast and easy and relatively cheap, that once it's done, doesn't look like any of those things. And that's it, once that's all been stirred together, and that chicken's absorbed the sauce, and the sauce has absorbed the chicken, we can go ahead and turn off the heat, and transfer that back into the bowl the chicken was in. And then once that's been bowled up, we can go ahead and add the last three ingredients, which will be the zest and juice from one lemon. And of course, always zest your lemon before you juice it. And if you're not sure why, just try it the other way around, and all shall be revealed. And then after the zest and juice, we'll finish up with a half cup of grated Gruyere cheese or the extremely flavorful cheese of your choice. Or you could go cheddar here or Gouda or Fontina, but no matter what you use, we'll go ahead and stir that in. And then very, very important, we need to let this cool down and then we have to wrap it and pop it in the fridge until it's completely chilled before we use it. All right, this is key. So make sure you do your filling ahead of time. And that's it, once our filling set, we can transfer on some thawed, possibly store-bought puff pastry onto a lightly floured piece of parchment paper. And by the way, I'm using a brand that's very commonly found in many chain grocery stores. And it comes folded into four quarters, which once unfolded works great for this recipe. But if you're making this homemade or using another brand, we need to end up with a rectangle about 12 inches wide by 15 long, or a give or take an inch. And once we transfer that on, what we'll do is lightly dust the top with flour, and then we'll top that with another piece of parchment, and then we'll give it a light press, and maybe a little bit of a rolling, 
to sort of flatten it out. And one annoying thing about store-bought puff pastry is the fact that it's folded up and has those seams, which can be a problem in a lot of recipes, but luckily this strudel technique is not one of them. And you'll see why very soon. And then before we make our cuts so we can weave our dough, we have to transfer this onto a sheet pan and pop it in the freezer for about 10 minutes so that it firms back up, since we don't want to, under any circumstances, cut puff pastry once it's thawed. Right, you're not gonna get clean cuts and the pieces will stick together, so please make sure your puff pastry is very, very cold, if not partially frozen before you do this next step. And once firm, I pulled it back out. And then what we'll do next is take the tip of a knife and we will very lightly score this into thirds, which I'm doing by cutting way too deep. Okay, we just wanna barely scratch the surface. And we really should use the back of the knife. And I'll show you why in just a minute. And then once I had that scored into thirds, I decided to trim a little bit off the edge, since we only want enough pastry to weave over the top. Plus it was a little ragged, although that probably wouldn't have mattered. But regardless, I went ahead and trimmed that off. And then next up, we'll take a pizza wheel or a knife. And then starting in the center, we'll cut at a little bit of an angle all the way to the edge. And we'll do that on both sides. And as I did this, I thought it was pretty even, but then I saw this overhead shot and it was not even close, which as it turns out really didn't matter that much. But if you can, try to get those about the same. And then what we'll do with one of those pieces we cut is brush a little bit of beaten egg on the edge and then we'll tuck that underneath this end and we'll kind of press that down. And we'll use that to help seal the end of our strudel. Although I decided I didn't need quite that much, so I trimmed off a little bit. And that's it once that's set. We can take our pizza wheel and we'll start making cuts every three quarters of an inch or so, beginning at the end of that center section, going all the way to the edge, following that angle we got when we cut those pieces off the top. And once we get to the end and we have just that small piece, we can just trim that little last piece of dough off. And once one side's done, we'll start with the other. And yes, it's very important to get the same number of cuts on one side as the other. So yes, you should count them and do the same number on the other side. And did I do that? No, no I didn't. And then once our cuts are done, we can transfer this back onto our sheet pan and we can top it with our filling, spooning that as evenly as we can down that center third. And again, this is only half the filling we made. All right, one recipe is gonna make enough for two of these strudels. And that's it once our chicken mushroom filling's been applied and we've done a little bit of fine tuning and a little bit of mushroom repositioning we will fold and press both ends of dough over our filling, and then we will begin this very simple weaving process, which simply involves folding one piece from one side over the top at a slight angle, and then we'll fold the strip from the opposite side over the top of that. And as long as you're doing every other one, there's really nothing that can go wrong here, just as long as the piece doesn't break off. Whoops. But if it does, don't worry. Just tuck it in and keep moving, like it never happened. And by the way, that's not gonna happen to you. Since when you score your dough into thirds, you're not gonna cut as deep as I did. You're just gonna barely scratch the surface. And that's it, we'll simply continue down the length, folding one side over and then the other. And as long as you have the same number of strips on either side, it's gonna come out perfect. And did I have the same number of strips on each side? No, I didn't. Okay, when I got to this point, I realized I had way more on one side than the other. So I just pulled some of that extra dough off and continued weaving the best I could. Right, you know when you're at a party and you're making this brilliant point after a couple drinks and you get to the end and you realize you don't really have a way to finish the point and it wasn't that brilliant to begin with, so you just kind of mumble and trail off? Well, that's basically what I did here. And by the way, even if you do this perfectly, you're probably still going to have some excess dough at the end when you finish, which we will definitely want to trim off like I'm doing here. And after trimming, we'll make sure all that's tucked under. But you know what? Even though I'm one of the world's worst pastry weavers, this still did not come out looking too bad. So at this point I was pretty happy. And then once our weave is done, or whatever you call what the heck I did, we'll go ahead and take the rest of that beaten egg and we will generously brush that all over the surface, which will give this an even more beautiful golden brown finish. And that's it, once that's been egg washed, it's ready to transfer into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 35 to 40 minutes or until it looks like this. Oh yeah, despite all that asymmetry and different numbers of strips on each side and highly suspect weaving technique, 
this still came out looking very, very impressive. So as you're shaping and weaving yours, please relax. It's going to be fine. I mean, you are after all the Rick Kim and Eric B. of what this will be. And as they would tell you, don't sweat the technique. Okay, once baked, this is going to look gorgeous. And that's it. Once out of the oven, I like to let it sit about 5 or 10 minutes before slicing it up. And if everything goes according to plan, when you cut yours, it should sound like this. Okay, so we really do want to push the envelope on the baking time. All right, don't burn it, but the bottom should be well browned and crisp. So everything was looking really good, and I could not wait to take a bite. And I should have done that by just picking that piece up. But for some reason, I grabbed a fork so that it would be harder and more awkward. All right, as usual, I will blame the low blood sugar. But I'm burying the lead, since that, my friends, was outstanding. Okay, I thought this had the perfect ratio between pastry and filling. And I really did love the texture of both. Oh, and I'm going to plate a piece up in a second. But if you were doing these for a party, you could just slice these up and put them on a tray. And they're actually really good at room temp. All right, again, as long as you've cooked it long enough. Since for this to really work, the pastry has to be crispy. Especially since our filling is so moist. And it's always going to soften that layer of puff pastry that's touching it. So the rest of the pastry really needs to be cooked through. But anyway, as promised, I went ahead and plated one up next to a beautiful prop salad. And yes, of course I turned that stock I made from the bones and scraps into a simple but beautiful sauce. And in case you're keeping score at home, I did finish that up with a little bit of freshly chopped tarragon. And not only would this be fantastic for some kind of special occasion dinner party, but if you're pinching pennies, and who isn't, the fact that we can make two of these with one single roast chicken makes this extremely affordable but without making any sacrifices with taste or appearance. Right, this looks fancy because it is fancy, but fancy does not mean hard. And I think I proved, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you don't need any kind of precise pastry master chef skills to get this done. Right, I probably couldn't have done that weaving any worse if I had tried, and it still came out, I think, looking incredible. Oh, and if you're not into chickens and or mushrooms, this is not really a recipe. It's much more of a technique. And any meat or vegetable filling with a similar texture will work beautifully to build one of these savory strudels. So use whatever you want. Although for the record, these flavors were incredible together. But whether you do your own thing or make this exactly as shown, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.